In today's episode, during listener Q&A, Daniel and I talk about how to manage unsolicited advice. And later, you'll meet Christiane Dobson, an architectural designer who's applying her expertise to her own old house. But first... I'm Stacey Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Cantor. And this is True Tales from Old Houses, episode 94. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Stacy. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. You know, every time we start the show and I say the number of the episode, I get a little butterfly in my stomach. Episode 94. We're getting close to 100. We're getting so close. I mean, I had nothing to do with the first 90, but um, (laughs) you are getting very close to 100 episodes. How does that feel? It feels wonderful. It feels kind of surprising because I'll tell you what, in the middle, you know, somewhere between episode 30 and 80, (laughs) all of those, yeah, it's like, well, I'm no longer at the beginning and now I'm closer to 100, but there's a lot of water that flows under the bridge there in the middle where you just keep going. You just keep doing the work and interviewing wonderful people and trying to fine tune the craft. And then now here we are almost at 100. And by next episode, we'll start to make some, I don't know, maybe to start some giveaways because I really want to do something Ooh. fun for this season to mark the 100th episode, which we're going to hit during season nine. So yay. It's so exciting. You should be so proud. It's a hard thing to stick with a project for years and you've done it in a way that still feels fresh, almost 90, well, 94 episodes in. It's like, (laughs) we're still talking about new things. And (laughs) I thought you were going to give me a percentage like, and it still feels fresh about 91% of the time. (laughs) You know, we capped out at 87%. No, I think... (laughs) A hundred percent of the time, Stacey. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Well, although you did just jump in here as the co-host, you have kind of been a big part of the show over the the years because you have been a guest several times. So now you're more of a permanent part and I couldn't be happier. I think if you do the math, I'm in like 4.5% of episodes <laughs> prior to me joining us. So a big part, I think, is uh, a little generous, but um, <laughs> but I sure had fun. All right. Well, before we launch into today's show, I do want to make sure to say thank you to our season nine sponsors, the Craftsman Store, Sutherland Wells, Preservin, and Abitron. And please, everyone out there, use those coupon codes. Enjoy what our sponsors offer because we are so lucky to have them. We really are. These sponsors are handpicked for you. They are all excellent resources and support them like they support us. So, Daniel, do you have any announcements today? I actually think I do have an announcement today. Okay, go for it. Oh my gosh, I have news. So, as you know, and some of the listeners who have listened to prior episodes with me, for about five years now, I have been the board chair of our local land bank, the Kingston City Land Bank. So, most of what we've done is take these very, very derelict vacant homes and do a full rehab and then turn around and sell them as affordable first-time homeownership opportunities. So, It's a really, really cool program that I'm really proud to have sort of helped build from the ground up. So the next phase of that work, I'm really excited about. So I have personally designed eight of our nine rehabs and I'm tired. And so one of the things that I've done is we have a design committee and it's sort of been my long-term dream to bring uh, volunteer designers who basically want to do the work that I've been doing and sort of have more diversity in both who's doing the work and the the end product. So we are currently seeking designers who want to volunteer some time. Basically, you'll get your own house that you're the lead designer on. You pick all of the fixtures, finishes. You work with the architect from day one on layouts and things like that. So I think it's going to be really exciting. I've already had a couple people email me. But if you are interested, please reach out. You can reach me on Instagram, of course, but um, chair the word chair, like the one you sit in, at kclb.org is where you can email me. And um, 
yeah, I really hope people volunteer to do this. It's it's very gratifying. Yeah, that's great. And you know what? I'm going to put that email in our show notes because that's kind of a tricky one to remember. So if you're out there and you're a designer, you know someone who is, that email will be right in the show notes for this episode um, over on True Tales from Old Houses. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for your support. You're very welcome. Well, after this wonderful thing that you're doing, I just need to tell everybody again that they have just a couple weeks to sign up for this vacation to the Canadian Maritimes, Montreal and Quebec City with me this summer, August 10th through 20th. And I'll tell you what, it feels really dumb saying that after you just said this wonderful, nice <laughs> thing that you're doing for the Kingston City Land Bank. But anywho... <laughs> <laughs> you do plenty of wonderful things, Stacey, including this. And I, um, I'm i trying to figure out, I might have a trip already on the books during that time, but it might also get canceled. So if it does, I'm taking a spot. Oh, that would be so incredible. We would love it. See, people may not want to travel with me, but maybe they want to travel with you <laughs> or both of us I am together. so grumpy. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, we will be seeing all sorts of old architecture and we're going to the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, Prince Edward Island for all of you Anne of Green Gables fans. And of course, Halifax and how we're going to find out how the city was shaped by the Halifax explosion. And that's all. So you need to go ahead and sign up for that trip as soon as possible, $200 holds your spot. And I don't think, and I think that spot has to be held by the end of April, but your final payment isn't due until the end of May. And they have a very generous refund policy and all sorts of contingencies in place if for some reason we can't take this trip, which I don't think is going to happen. Hopefully we're out of that touch and go period a little bit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So the other thing I have too, I have another announcement, just a super quick one. Promise it's quick, but I've been having all of these requests or several requests for an episode about Sears kit homes. Yes. I love Sears houses. Yeah. Sorry. I got really excited. No, I'm glad. (laughs) I'm glad you're excited because I'm excited too, but I don't know enough to have an episode yet. So I guess the process about ordering them through the catalog and what choices you had, all that, it just sounds so much fun to order a house out of a catalog. So I guess, unbeknownst to you, Daniel, you and I are both now looking for (laughs) a guest to come on who's really familiar with Sears kit houses, who would like to do an episode with us so that we can fulfill the wishes of the listeners who keep asking me about it. And also, I, there's so much to learn and so much to enjoy. They're just, they're so cool. I love that kind of period of housing history. I know a little bit about it, not enough to inform an entire episode, but it's so cool. Have you ever spent time looking at those catalogs? Oh my gosh, they're so cool. And of course, they're like, you know, $8,000 for everything you need to build a 4,000 square foot Victorian. <laughs> like, they're just incredible. We have several around town here that look like the Lego houses, you know, the, with the little blocks that you would buy. And I think those are Sears kit houses. They look like they're little cement blocks and you would just kind of put your house together oh, with these. Things. Yeah, I'll take a couple pictures and put those on show notes. I may be completely misguided and somebody will point that out. And that's fine. I appreciate that. I don't recall ever coming across a a masonry one, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's why we need someone who knows what they're talking about. So if you can help with that topic or you know someone who can, uh, please contact us at truetalesfromoldhouses.com. Thanks. All right. So aside from land bank stuff, or is that really all you have time for now? (laughs) What else is going on? (laughs) <laughs> oh no, uh, just working on like another several houses. So things are moving along at uh, my little project house down the street. So I just did a, a project that I was like a pig in mud. It, I was so happy. Everyone that follows me knows I use a lot of uh, scrap and salvaged lumber in my projects. I don't like to buy new wood if I don't have to. So because I finally am sort of at the last room of millwork, what I got to do was take all of my scraps, like run it through a planer, put a bead on it, and then install it as like variable with beadboard wainscoting. And so it was just so exciting to like kind of get this stuff out of buckets and trash cans and everything and onto the wall. And it looks really beautiful and it's going to paint up nicely. And I'm just really happy with kind of being able to close out the project that way a little bit. It's It just feels like the house has sort of come together finally in a way I'm really proud of. 
are you technically out of, I know this is a dumb question. Are you out of scrap? Like, are you talking about reaching no. the end of, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I was so nervous that I was going to run out. And so like, I've been squirreling stuff from like Brad's lake house that he takes out. And stuff. <laughs> Turns out I didn't really need it, but I do have like one more kind of woodwork project in that house. And then my house needs so much work still that I'll use my discretion, but I'll say, I'll save plenty of it for future projects. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, last time we had an episode, I was heading to Austin and I did yes. go to Austin, Texas. And you were telling me about, you felt like they kind of had an architectural heyday during the mid-century. And I probably, it's just where I stayed, but I didn't really see that. So <laughs> I could have made it up, Stacey. <laughs> I love to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you stay? That's not, you do not. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed, Andy and I stayed right downtown. We stayed at a hotel called the Fairmont because we were there for something for his work. So we didn't choose the hotel, but it was in a really cool area right near Rainy Street. And I don't know if anybody, I'm sure some of you have been to Austin and Rainy Street is a little, it's cute. It's like a little historical or historic like a little historic bar district. It's about, I don't know, a block, maybe two. And all the bars along there are converted old houses. So you have these little bungalows. I remember that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So it's super cute. It's so cool. Yeah. We went out one night. It ended up being the very end of South by Southwest, which is a two-week festival of technology and art and music and lots of drinking and loudness and <laughs> all sorts of things. So we were there. And the I've heard there's drugs. <laughs> oh, I think you're right. Yes. Actually, a funny story about that. Somebody came up to us and said, it was really loud. So all of the bars were playing music and and we'd gone out and we just had a you know an individual drink, a single drink, not drinks. And we were walking home and it was really loud. And this lady came up to us and she had something in a bag and she said, hey, do you want an something. And I said, I said, and Andy and I looked at each other. We're like, no, no, we're okay. So we walked on and he, I said, what'd she say? And he, I thought she said, here, do you want, we're giving away an Advil. And he said, no, no, we're giving away an edible. Wow. <laughs> so we both heard that differently. I was like, oh. So anyway, we did, we took neither an Advil or an edible. <laughs> <laughs> but the city Proud of you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it, it wasn't a stretch for us, but the city did change right after South by Southwest was over. You know, there was kind of like this shoo, we thought, wow, this is like loud and everybody's out and having a good time. And then of course Monday rolled around and it's like, okay, we're dead now. <laughs> Nothing is happening yeah. here. <laughs> Which I, I mean, can't maybe blame. They them. were giving away ad bell. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Possibly. <laughs> anyway, Austin was pretty neat. I think Andy and I had sort of had it just loosely penciled in as maybe one of those places we might want to end up living at some point. And after visiting, although we enjoyed our time there very much, I think we we erased it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I never really considered living there, but I, I had the same experience. I liked it, but I, I, yeah. Yeah, nice place to visit. And that little rainy street was super cute. We did a lot of driving around. I took a tour actually of the, it was called the, Street art and food trucks. It was a little tour. So we went around and saw the street art and it was it, it was fun. And then also Andy and I, on one of our days, we went to Lady Bird Johnson, or not Lady Bird Johnson, I'm sorry, LBJ. They have the same initials. At the LBJ Library, we went to the Texas History Museum and we went to the Capitol and it was fine. We had, we had a good time. Wow. Yeah. You got a lot in. You were only there for a few days, right? Yeah, we were really only there for four days and... I wish I'd been able to explore more of the music scene, but we did kind of get a, a taste, a taste of the city. Yeah. This is why you want to travel with Stacy. She knows how to do it. It is really fun. I like that. I always wish I could take a, a two, and sometimes I do. I go to the same place twice. In fact, when we go to Halifax, I've already been there. When we go to Prince Edward Island, I've already been there. But I do like that idea of going once for the overview and then going back for sort of more in-depth but, you know, who does that on vacation? Not everybody. That's a luxury, right? The first vacation's a luxury. The second one is just gross. All business. <laughs> it's all business, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we do have to take a break, Daniel. All right. You know I like the breaks. Though. I know. I know. Your favorite part. But listener Q&A is up next. Mm -hmm. 
True Tales from Old Houses is supported by the Craftsman Store, another excellent resource from Scott Seidler of the Craftsman blog. The Craftsman Store is your go-to place for old house tools and supplies. Once again, our friend Scott has taken the hassle out of tracking down all of those specialized old house supplies that we need. He's put them all in one place for us. It's a great little online hardware store full of books, tools, and replacement parts. So I found something new on his site this week, and I actually own a copy of it. He just recently did plans for a storm window glass and screen combo. So he has the building plans for those that you can get. I, I know. need that immediately. <laughs> I know. So that's a new thing on his site. Uh, of course, I get diamond glazing points from there and all kinds of other little things, but it's just, oh, he is so talented. I could spend hours on that. I mean, take all my money, Scott. It's great. He has glazing point drivers, which are really hard to find. So from window restoration to plaster repair to really almost anything, They have everything you need to do the job like a pro. So check it out today at thecraftsmanstore.com and save 10% on your order if you use the code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Preservin, a unique preservation franchise opportunity developed by longtime window restoration pro and our friend Ty McBride. The mission of Preservin is to save the future by preserving the past. Preservin is so cool. So Stacy, tell us what it is. Well, what if you could go to work every day on your own terms while also doing something meaningful within your community? And what if you could start a home service business without owning complicated and expensive tools that are difficult to transport to and from job sites? I would like all of that, yes. The team at Preservant will train and support you to operate a Preservant business within your community, equipping you with the tools you need to perform sustainable wood rot repairs and build your own team of epoxy techs. Cool. How does that part work? Well, as a Preservant franchise owner, you'll receive the playbook for a proven preservation business, exclusive access to ever resin epoxy products, business software, and all of the marketing, advertising, training, and technical support you need. Owning a Preservant franchise offers the perfect opportunity for work-life balance while serving your neighbors and community in a recession-proof industry. That all sounds so great. I love the idea of being able to work your own hours and spend the rest of your time in ways that are important to you. So to learn more about becoming a part of the Preservin family and their mission, go to Preservin, that's P-R-E-S-E-R-V-A-N, PreservinFranchise.com slash True Tales. Okay, we are back and it's time for listener Q&A. I love listener Q&A. Hit me. All right. Well, this one is an interesting one. Today's question comes from Olivia, and she asks, how do you deal with unsolicited house advice from strangers online, family, etc.? And go, Daniel. <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm about to offend everyone, but I'm, in the interest of honesty, I will be honest. How's that? Okay, so I guess what I would say is cautiously is how I deal with unsolicited house advice from strangers online. So I guess I do a few things to try to mitigate my sense of overwhelm because the reality is everyone has an opinion and a lot of them are are right. They're fine. They're valid opinions. But there's also generally many good options. And so I think what I do is I tend to post my like stories where I post about my progress on projects. I'm usually a week or two behind on those. And part of that is because I want to kind of have the decision made before I get a bunch of feedback on it. The other thing is I really don't ask. That doesn't stop people from telling me, but I, when I'm sort of debating something, you will note I do not ask the question, what would you do? And I think the reason for me is I just get really overwhelmed with it. And I think when you take in sort of too much unsolicited or solicited, I guess, advice, it's a really efficient way to end up with a really, really boring space. Because I think when everybody unanimously seems to like something, to me, that's kind of a red flag that it's like done or boring or, you know, I don't want really to be universally appealing. Of course, I want my spaces to be appealing, but Yeah. So I think that's the first thing. 
And then I think the thing to remember is like, only you can really see where you're going with something. So people tend to get really hung up on like individual elements and aren't necessarily taking into account how it'll look in the entire finished room. I recently had an experience (laughs) where... I was debating this little countertop of a built-in in in this bathroom that I'm renovating. And while I would have liked to go with a natural stone, it was just way out of the budget. And so what I mentioned doing was maybe just tiling it with the wall tile. It's really small. It's not like a kitchen countertop. How could you, Daniel? How could you? (laughs) It was as though I proposed like putting shag carpet on it. Like it was, I've committed a mortal sin. So then what did I do? I turned around and did it anyway, because that's (laughs) my toxic trait is tell me not to, and I really want to. So yeah, and honestly, I think it looks great. It was basically free. I'm really, really happy with it. So stick to your guns. Ask for advice when you need it. What am I missing? You tell me. I was going to say, the older I get, the less I care. Sometimes people will tell me what they're thinking, and I don't even know. It doesn't register with me that they're trying to tell me what to do. I mean, I... I could say that I'm clueless, but I like to think it's just because I've matured and I just don't care. But, you know, I've done some things in my life that were, I think you and I were talking about this question beforehand. And I said, well, you know, I've had a home birth, so I've (laughs) received plenty of unsolicited advice in my past. But usually what I do is if I really know that unsolicited advice is going to get to me, you know, and I'm a pretty even keel personality. But if I know that I just don't have the bandwidth to deal with it, then I'll start, I'll preface something, especially when it comes to family or something. And I'll tell them, you know, I'm going to tell you something and I think you're going to have a lot of opinions about it, or you're going to have a lot of worries and concerns. But I had worries and concerns too, and I'm still choosing to do this. And here's what that thing is. And this is for people that you truly, truly care about. Like you're, you know, people who are very close to you, who you ultimately value their opinion because you love them, but that doesn't mean you're going to do the thing that they want you to do. But you just let them know, like, I know this is going to make you feel concerned or worried or whatnot, but you know I've already done my research. I've already made my decision. I just want to let you know because I care mm-hmm. about you, that kind of thing. So that's kind of how I handle people who really should have a say in it. As far as like if I'm at, out with strangers and they start telling me something about, uh, like I've been at dinner parties before and the person who invited me knows that I work with Original Windows and she thinks it's so great. And so she doesn't do that same thing, Mm -hmm. but she thinks it's wonderful. So she always introduces me as, you know, this is my friend Stacy and she works on original wood windows. And nine times out of 10, I'll get somebody who'll go, oh, that's cool. But every now and then that 10th person will be like, why would you (laughs) do that? That's so dumb. Windows are leaky. They're terrible. We got rid of all of ours. And I could be that person at the party who started a little something. (laughs) (laughs) Or I could just eat my dinner and deflect or, you know, change the Mm -hmm. subject because it's not the time or place and I don't care. I really don't care. I'll be that person at a party. (laughs) Yeah. No problem with it. Yeah. As far as social media, direct messages, personal messages, the final thing I would say is that you simply don't have to answer them. I don't condone that as a means of communication, ignoring people. I think that's very rude. But then again, sometimes unsolicited advice is rude. So if it makes you feel uncomfortable or it's confrontational and it's not somebody that you have a relationship with, you do not owe them an answer. Fair enough. And I would just, before we close this out, I want to set the record straight that I think I can speak for both Stacy and I that we love interacting with people. It's why we keep our messages and stuff on and active. Don't feel attacked, but also don't feel offended when we ignore your advice. (laughs) Olivia, thank you very much for that excellent and uh, challenging question. And if anyone else has a question for us to answer on an upcoming episode, please go to truetalesfromoldhouses.com and submit it through the contact form. If your question is too technical for us, we'll try to find a pro to help answer it. And we love answering questions, so please. By all means, ask us questions, send us emails, write us direct messages. Just no opinions. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, just no opinions. We just don't care what you think. Yes, (laughs) we do deeply, (laughs) but not that deeply. (laughs) We do. We absolutely do. Okay, but we do need to take another quick break, Daniel. All right. Let's do it. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by Sutherland Wells. All of Sutherland Wells products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island with the highest quality, sustainably grown tongue oil. 
Tong oil, native to China, has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. Unlike polyurethane, which is so last season, tongue oil finish penetrates the surface of the wood, so it flexes and contracts as conditions change, which makes it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. One of the things I encourage everyone to do is to follow Sutherland Wells on social media because they do special features of each of their products and they have so much available. They talk about best uses, what it's good for, what it's not good for, and it really helps answer those questions. But they also have wonderful customer service. So if you end up having any questions about what you should use, you just send them an email and you'll get all the information that you need. Now, specifically for pre-coat, when I mix it with my primer, I use Clarabelle's. But they do have, like I just said, an entire line for whatever you're working on right now. Whether it's siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, new pieces, cutting boards, you name it. So to learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells. That's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code. True Tales. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Abitron, which is now a division of UC Coatings. Abitron manufactures two of my very favorite products, and you know them, Liquid Wood and Wood Epox, because I've talked about them so much on Instagram and my blog. Now, this week, I actually had a conversation with someone who has new windows, and they wanted my advice. I usually do not work with new windows. You know that. Their windows were from the 80s, but they had wood, and I realized, you know, I'm always talking about Abitron products for old wood, but they work on newer wood just as well. Sure. And all of these old houses, you know, sometimes there's an addition and, and one part of the addition has new wood and then there's the original part of the house. Liquid wood and wood epox products, they make permanent cost-effective repairs wherever you find rotted or damaged wood, new or old. And whether you're a first-timer or a professional tradesperson, Abitron products are super easy to use because the instructions are so simple. And there's no shrinking or sagging and repairs can be sanded and painted just like wood. And they also offer other great products specifically for concrete repair, plaster repair, window glazing. I even saw porcelain refinishing, which I can't wait to try. So check out their website at abitron.com or follow them on Instagram at abitron underscore UC or on Facebook at Abitron, a division of UC Coatings. And from now until May 5th, Abitron has a special coupon code just for True Tales from Old Houses listeners. So enter SPRING10 at abitron.com for 10% off your order. That's SPRING10 to save 10% on your order at abitron.com. We are back, and our guest today is Christiane Dobson. Christiane and her husband made the leap from New York City to rural upstate New York during COVID, and they are loving their new small town life. Hi, I am Christiane Dobson, and I live in upstate New York, and I've been renovating an old farmhouse for a couple of years. And yeah. Well, welcome. Welcome, Christiane. Thanks so much. Welcome to the podcast, Christiane. Well, Christiane, it's so nice to meet you. We've been following you on Instagram for quite some time. You've got a heck of a project, sort of a hobby farm going there in the Catskills. And I'm just interested in learning more about you. Well, first, so we're up in we're up in the Catskills, uh, Northwestern Catskills, just outside of a town called Delhi. And we bought our house in 2018. We were actually originally looking for a larger apartment or home in the city because we have a we have an apartment in Harlem which we still have it's very tiny <laughs> very very tiny and you know we were just looking for more space i've always wanted some kind of outdoor space so we were just looking for more space and with things you know real estate in the city being what it is it was pure chaos and um everything kind of fell through and this house that we have now um kind of fell into our laps and it was perfect. Currently, how much time are you splitting between the two? How often are you down in Harlem? Since the pandemic, a lot of people have kind of moved up here full time. So like we're, we're since then, 
we've really been here full time. So this has really become our home base, which is wonderful because it's something that I've always wanted. And a lot of the times, actually, when we go back to the city, you know, like we end up staying with my family in Brooklyn because, you know, like we're there to visit my parents or my brother or I'm there for work and I need, you know, built in babysitter. <laughs> so we end up staying with my parents a lot. So like, sadly, our, our apartment and home is like on, like kind of on its own for now. And we're trying to figure out what we're going to do, what we're going to do with it. But, you know, the Catskills has really become our home and like we're really building a life here, which I'm very happy about. Have you ever lived in an environment like this? I know Delhi, it's a very different world than New York City. So it's going to sound insane, but a long while ago, I was living in Long Island City. It still had that kind of small town feel, which was really nice. You know, like you went to the dog park and like everybody knows everyone. You go to the coffee shop, like people know your regular order. And it had that really like small town feel, which I, I really loved. I mean, that that has since like come and gone. And, you know, it's not it really doesn't feel that way anymore. But I like that small town feel. We came up a few times to visit because our friends had a cabin up here. So that's how we were introduced to the area. And we just found ourselves coming up more and more and more and spending more time here. And it was just a lifestyle that I really enjoyed. Okay, so let's talk about the house because you said you went, you found it. It was perfect. Tell us about the house. What kind of house do you have? So it is an old like 1800s farmhouse and it's, so it's an old Greek revival and it's been, it's had like a couple of like very old extensions on it. It's a deceivingly large home <laughs> and it's, we're sort of rural, but still very close to the town of Delhi. And we still have neighbors, but because of the way the houses around here are all situated, you can't really see anybody. So it feels very isolated, but you're not. <laughs> So you kind of get like the best of all worlds here, which has been really, really wonderful. What kind of condition was the house in? I mean, was it ready to move in or have you been, what have you been doing to it since you moved there? You know, the people who had the house before us are actually our next door neighbors who are absolutely wonderful. (laughs) And they've been a great resource for just, you know, information and history of the house. So it was in livable condition. It just hadn't really been updated in a long time. So it needed some upgrades, some updates. The downstairs bathroom was in sort of rough shape and had some leaks happening. So there was a lot of like maintenance stuff that needed to be done. The kitchen was kind of, it felt very like 70s, 60s, 70s, like old kitchen that really had been loved. (laughs) Loved hard and like needed a bit of a redo. So we actually ended up gutting that whole kitchen. We kept the layout basically the same. And then there was a this giant um, kind of oil barrel looking wood stove in the corner of the kitchen that, you know, when I first saw the house, I wanted something cute that had like a glass door that you could see the fire from. And after our first winter here, we're just like, I love you, oil drum. (laughs) So so we've kept it. We've kept it. And I absolutely love it. It heats like the whole downstairs like really well, just, just on its own. We've been trying to do sort of like a gentle renovation of the house, um, trying to keep with the style of the home. It's sort of more like a rehab, but we're trying to keep everything within the style of the home. I feel like you're downplaying the amount of change, though, that you guys have been able to enact in this. I mean, the (laughs) kitchen is gorgeous. I have more questions about it, too, but it's really beautiful. Sounds like a very sympathetic rehab or renovation, for sure. And let's get into that, Daniel. Go for it. You said you had questions about the kitchen. And it's funny because I I get this feeling from you, uh, Christiane, that you're like really sort of humble and, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But anybody who spends any time on your account on Instagram knows that is incorrect. This is a gorgeous house. So let's get into some of those details. Go ahead, Daniel. (laughs) You're welcome. You guys have done most of the work yourselves, I think. I would say we've done a lot of the finishing ourselves because I am very, uh, a nice way of saying it, very, very particular (laughs) about how I want things and how I like 
things done, you know, a little bit of a controller. So I, I've taken that on. I want to clarify too, you're also an architectural designer, is that correct? Yes. So that makes sense that you would be concerned a little bit with the details and doing things right. Yes. When I say match the existing trim, I mean match it exactly. Not kind of, not similar, exactly. Which my husband can attest to because I made him pry off a lot of the trim that our our general contractor did for us, which he did, did a really good job. But it didn't match exactly. Everything was a quarter inch proud of where it should have been. So Chris had to pull all of it out, cut it down a quarter of an inch and (laughs) reinstall it. So it was perfect. (laughs) I feel bad for him. (laughs) I completely get it. I'm such a stickler about moldings and trim, like specifically. Yes. I was literally just having this conversation an hour ago with one of the GCs on the, of these land bank houses that we're renovating and. They want to put like one by four where they're supposed to be beautiful oak trim with a, you know, nice header and they'll do it. They'll do it. But I wanted to ask some of the kind of skills are from your background. Not all of them, but what is your background? I know only to Long Island City. Oh, okay. Um, So, okay. Oh, we won't start at the beginning, beginning, beginning. But I went to design high school. I went to LaGuardia. So I've always been into like art and design and things like that. I was an art major there. And I actually had taken an architecture class while in high school, which kind of introduced me to architecture. So that's kind of where that came from. Because I always knew I wanted to do something like design and people related. And I went to the University of Minnesota and I actually started out as an anthropology and archaeology major. (laughs) So I did that for a semester and did not like it. It was not for me. (laughs) It was not for me. And I transferred over to the architecture school. So I did, so my back, my degree is in architecture and I've worked um, for a number of years in retail architecture. I did retail design. I worked on a variety of projects. I worked for um, Liz Claiborne for a number of years and like all of their different brands and then went to an architecture firm and I worked on Century 21 and Whole Foods and like with the school construction authority on a school and like a, a lot of different things and then went back to retail because I, I, like I like the pace of retail because I always like to be doing something new. So that retail world is fast paced and there are a lot of projects that you're juggling all at once. And I like the refined chaos of it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So you've done some really interesting kind of reuse or just use of sort of resources around the property. So I know kitchen countertops, I think, came from a tree on your property. (laughs) Tell me more about how all of that comes about. You know, it's like you you do these projects and, you know, like over time and stuff, and you kind of forget all of the like crazy little details and stuff. So the contractor that we've been using is actually a neighbor. And the woods that extend behind our house go all the way back, like and back onto his property. So the wood came off of his property, but it's the same woods and lots and lots of maple trees that are at the back of our house. So he had some wood that had been sitting in his barn for a few years that, you know, he made planks out of and it just needed to be worked a little bit, but he just had a lot of material. So invited us to just go through the barn and find some wood that we liked. So, you know, he had pointed out this like pile of maple that had come from the woods from behind our houses. Um, That's kind of where I started looking and I found a few pieces that I really, really loved. They were all similar in depth and things like that. So they would work for a countertop and they had like a lot of the like little worm holes. They had a lot of, oh my God, like knots and things through it. And it just was, it just had a lot of personality and I was really excited about it. So I picked those and he made the countertops in our kitchen for us and they were beautiful. So the the giant cutout that we had for our sink, because we got a pretty wide, like 30, 36 inch sink. So the cutout from that, he made a cutting board for us that we use all the time as well. So we've used like all the pieces of that wood and like the, the backsplash is also the same maple. And I love it. I love that. It's beautiful. I'm not a designer. I'm not 
an architect. I'm not any of those things. So I always like to ask this question of someone because I think that our brains work very differently. And I think your brain and Daniel's brain probably works very similar. But my question to you is, when you go into a house like yours, do you see all of its potential and see what it's going to be? Or does that come about as you move on? Does it look like a blank slate to you? Or can you actually visualize the things you want to put in there and how it will look when it's done? I use that in quotes because none of these are ever done, but go ahead. (laughs) It actually depends on the space. A lot of times, like when I walk in, I can see the potential. And then once I start kind of thinking like, okay, well, we can take this out, move this here, do this, maybe move that wall, change that, change that. Like I can see it. I can visualize it. I can see what it could be. And I can see the different options as well. My brain has always just, you know, been that way. I've always like liked building things and making things. And what's great about this place is I can actually physically come in and like do things myself, which is really, which is really fun. But yeah, like when I, when I walk into a space, like I can visualize what it could be and different options for what it could be. And that's one of the things that I really like, which is why, you know, I, I, I do the job that I do Like I'm in, in design and construction. I'm designing construction all day long, every day. It's all I do really. But I like the potential of a space. Like I love my, one of my favorite parts is the demo. Because it's not done and it could be anything. And like, that's just so much fun. And I know it's like a place where a lot of people will feel anxiety and stress. It's like, it's messy, it's dirty, like there's nothing in here, things are ripped apart. But that's like the fun stage because it's like you get to make it a thing. And then like once it's done, it's done. So it's like, well, now the potential is gone. Like I love the potential of the space and... I think that's why I do the work that I do because like I get that outlet because like everything there's always a new project another thing to do so even when that's done it's like I'm already working on like two or three or four or eight other projects at the same time so there's always something happening and you know there's always like the potential to be something different and new which is which is exciting. Is it equally more or less satisfying to work on your own project versus having sort of a different creative outlet working for other people? Um, It's the same. It's really the same. I mean, I think it's actually easier working on other people's projects than my own. Like right now, nothing's finished. (laughs) Nothing's finished. And I'm already thinking, you know, like, well, what am I going to do for Charlotte's room? So I have like a thousand paint samples, a mild exaggeration. And I like, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. I get like a little decision fatigue as well. And there's so many different options And it's kind of hard to pin down exactly what I want. But when I'm doing stuff for other people, it is weirdly clear for me. Like, I'm just like, oh, this, 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 this. I get a sense of who you are, what you want, how you want things to be. I know what you like, and I can give you that. But for me, it's just like, there are just so many options. And it's like, oh, I could do this. I could do it this way. I could do that. Like, I need 30 bedrooms for Charlotte. (laughs) I feel exactly the same way. I feel this so deeply. When you get to make up all of the options and make the decision and you've done a bunch of houses or you want to do a bunch of houses, it just is so hard to commit to stuff for yourself, I think. Like I have the same experience. Super easy for clients. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like once you've made that decision, that decision's been made and now you're like, you're just doing it. But what if I want to do another child's room? with all these other ideas that I had, <laughs> you know, it's just like, uh. yeah. And to go back to Charlotte's room, I would think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you go into a client's house and they say, you know, I would like you to do this room for me. I have a nine-year-old boy. He likes Pokemon and baseball and he is energetic. And obviously you're not going to make him a Pokemon bedroom, but you're like, oh, okay, that paints a picture. Yeah. I know who that person is, but your little girl, she's changing every day. So you think, okay, I'm going to make her this beautiful pink room because I like pink and she likes pink, but maybe next year or three years from now or four years from now, she's going to prefer something completely different. And therefore, you know, you kind of feel like we all want to make these spaces that will grow with our families and grow with our kids. But someone like you who's creatively minded, like you said, you have a million ideas. So I would imagine you'd have to hold yourself back from redoing this room over and over again. Just exactly. (laughs) Did I fully fabricate that your husband is British? You did not. He is. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) He's from Yorkshire. Yorkshire. 
yeah, I'm not even going to do an accent because it's disgusting. <laughs> I just defended <laughs> everyone. I can't wait to have all of the people from Yorkshire <laughs> write in, all two of them, and say, what was that? What was that, Daniel? I'm so sad. I'm going to work on my dialects. But I mean, there's such a sort of specific, well, I feel like there's a very specific sort of British sensibility and style that I can at least picture. And I feel like you've definitely brought some of that into the house, like especially with the kitchen. How do you feel like he's, I guess I have two questions. Like what is sort of the creative split between you guys? Because... I'm sure working with somebody like you who has strong opinions and, you know, knows what you want and this is what you do for a living, that's hard. And then number two, like, what's a guy from Yorkshire sort of doing with this house in Delhi, New York, which is a very small town, in a house that is a very specifically American style. Greek revival is, like, deeply American. So what's funny about Chris is he comes from a small town and it's very countryside little town in Yorkshire. And he was never really excited about, you know, spending full time up here because it was very similar to the place where he's from. And he thought he'd be bored. Hilariously, not at all. We are probably more social here than we were in the city And we just have a lot going on. We, you know, we've got a lot of stuff with the house. We have friends up here. We have Charlotte. There's just a lot. So he's come completely 180 around and absolutely loves it here. And as far as construction and things like that, so his dad is a joiner. So which is basically like a carpenter and things like that. He does a lot of uh, woodworking, like all different types of woodworking and joinery. And so is his brother. His uncle also has a construction business. So Chris has done a lot of that work prior to me. He also has a pretty strong design sensibility. You know, he used to draw, he does, he takes photos. He has kind of this artistic background as well, but he's definitely has a more like analytical brain than I do. Um, (laughs) We're just, we're in different directions, but he has, he has a really good sense of design and unfortunately, a lot of opinions of his own. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isn't that so annoying? <laughs> there is compromise that does have to happen, you know, and like it's our house. So I want us both to be happy here. There's certain things that, you know, like if I feel very strongly, you know, I'll just, I'll just do what I want. And there are other things that he feels really strongly about. So I'll give in and like, we'll do that. So there's a lot of compromise that happens. And thankfully... We have a very, very similar design aesthetic. The kitchen was very Duvall influenced. I mean, everybody Mm -hmm. loves Duvall. (laughs) It's beautiful. And, you know, like that's kind of where that came from. And I wanted wanted the house to have a very comfortable, cozy, lived-in look, but with a little bit of... British influence and and things like that. And I think, I think we're getting, we're getting there. Well, your home is really such a lovely mix of, you know, patterns and textures. And I hope that people will visit your Instagram. Will it's Catskill Farmhouse. We'll say that again at the end and put it in the show notes, but it's just something about the way you use texture and pattern. And another thing that's not something that I'm particularly good at either. I'm just like sort of straightforward. I'm, I'm, I'm very linear when it comes to stuff. Your house is incredible. (laughs) Stacey loves to say this, like her house is impeccably decorated. You pick the wallpaper. You pick the paint. It's fantastic. It all coordinates and looks great together. You do a good job. Well, thank you. Stacey, we're going to work on your self-talk later. (laughs) Okay, we'll do that. I just tend to think that the house is already pretty. And so like my job is just to fix it. When I was asking you, I said, you know, how do you see things when you move it? I have no idea. When I go into a place, I think, okay, this has potential, but I don't know what that potential is. Like, I immediately start seeing what's broken. And it does, it's not a negative because I'm coming at it from a negative thing, but I'm like, okay, that's broken, but I know how to fix that. And that's broken. And I don't know, but I can tell that it's not going to be something that's a deal breaker. You know, these are the things that go through my head, not like, oh, this could be a beautiful home and we'd be so cozy here and and moving walls. Like, I'm not even there. Like, all I can see is what's right here in front of my face, not two years down the road or five years down the road or anything like that. That's a great skill to have too. It's such a restorer's mentality, Mm -hmm. I think. And I feel like, just to bring it back to me for a second, (laughs) I feel like (laughs) I have like a a mix of these two things, but what Christiane is describing where it's, 
more like you can walk in and see it. For me, at least, I, that skill took many, many years to develop, I think, and I continue to. So I don't want people to feel like just because you may not be able to do that now doesn't mean you never will. Like, I felt like a real imposter for years because I was like, I, I don't have that. I can't do that. And now I feel like I can. People can learn a lot. I mean, you can learn. You can learn how to do these things. It's like, that's why there's an architecture school. That's why there's interior design school. <laughs> like, there are schools for things. And, like, you can learn how to train your eye and things like that. It's like, yeah, some people do have a natural affinity for a thing. But you also have to develop it. You know, like, there are people who I see, like, who I follow on Instagram as well, who are, you know, like, not designed, like, not formally trained or anything and doing beautiful incredible work and I'm always really impressed and I'm more sometimes more impressed because you know it's like that's just coming straight from them there's no outside influence or you know there's no outside training that has honed that that's just them just going out there and trying and doing it and like these DIYers I'm just like I'm so impressed the old house community is an amazingly resourceful bunch aren't they Absolutely. Because I get, I do get asked a lot, you know, it's like, oh, well, how do you know how to do this? And it's like, oh, you know, like, oh, it's probably your background. And like, a little bit, yes, but you know, a, a lot, no, it's just, I'm not afraid to do it wrong, <laughs> especially in my own house. I'm not afraid to do it wrong and have to redo it. And there are a lot of wonderful resources. And, you know, like people like Stacey and people like you, know, the two of you have, who have asked questions <laughs> and answered my questions, you know, and it's just, the old house community has been quite incredible and really helpful. And if you don't know the answer, you can help guide to another person who you might follow who has done it and can help out. And everyone's been so gracious and willing to help. And it's been a really, really wonderful community to you know, find myself in and a part of. And I, I love it. It's pretty great. I agree. It's a lot of cool people. <laughs> Well, Christian, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun. And I really hope we get to hang out soon. You're really not that far away. And tell everyone, tell the, the masses how we can follow you and your progress on this house. I am at Catskill Farmhouse on Instagram. And that's where I live publicly. <laughs> so you can find me there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Come back and see us sometime. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was really fun. And yeah, I'd love to I'd love to talk more uh, kitchen detail with you guys another time. Sounds great, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses. And thank you to our guest today, Christian Dobson. To continue the conversation, join us on Facebook and Instagram at True Tales from Old Houses and individually at Blake Hill House and at Daniel Cantor. And to learn more about everything we discussed in today's episode or request a transcript, please visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com. And of course, Stacy and I would be very, very happy if you would take the time to leave a review and subscribe to this podcast. It's a great way to support the show and let others know that it's worth a listen. Until next time. See you soon.